proclaiming the name of our Messiah, our God, Yehovah, Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, God himself. Glad to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. I want you to continue in that thought pattern as we've worshiped together, as we've blessed his holy name, as we've pronounced his name and proclaimed it on high. We've been reading through the scriptures, and uh, in 2015, we've just started. Uh, there's so much that's packed in those first parts. And as we get introductions into Genesis and introductions into Matthew, they just uh, come together with uh, an explosion of ideas and thoughts as I've begun to think about the direction of how we're going to do this through this year. And it's an exciting time. We've read in Genesis and Matthew and, and uh, up to Genesis 24. Boy, there's a lot of time that goes on in that first 24 chapters of Genesis and a lot of power that's packed in there for us to be able to decipher and understand what it means uh, in our lives. I wanted to continue with that today in Genesis without much uh, introduction into it, give you just a little bit of quick review. We've, had, we've spent about three sessions, I believe, in Genesis so far. And, and just seeing the foundations that are laid uh, right here. And there, there are so many hours of study that we could be giving uh, in, in just these, these little few words and beginnings in Genesis that will help us understand what the Gospels are about and what the Messiah is about and how all of this comes together and forms one thought pattern, one book. And I want to remind you today as we look at this that it all draws us together uh, uh, into one thought pattern that God is giving us uh, a, a story of redemption, a story of grace. Uh, the whole thing comes together, even from the very beginning, as God's purpose for man. And as we try to realize and look in our own, uh, uh, our own perspective of God and God's plan in our lives, uh, I believe that God has a specific plan for me in my life. As well as I believe that God has a specific plan for you in your life. And I believe as we walk this journey with Him, as we open our hearts and our minds and explore His Word, that He will open paths before us, that He will help us to understand the journey that we are on, the purpose that we have in life. Uh, it appears to me that so many in today's world and today's society are without purpose. Uh, meaningless life, meaningless actions, and yet God has designed from day one, even from the, before the foundations of the earth, He knew us and He prepared for us and He planned for us and He planned a purpose in our lives. So as we look for that purpose and as we accomplish that purpose, we recognize who God is and He begins to direct our paths. We started in the very first verse of Genesis in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We realize that in Hebrew there's only seven words, translated ten words in English, but those seven words are a foundation for us. When we looked at those, we decided that the center axis of this whole thing is that et or the Aleph Tav that uh, reminds us that that is the, the creation story. The purpose from the very beginning is for us to understand that it all revolves around the Messiah. The first sentence in the Bible indicates that. That Aleph Tav, that Alpha and Omega. Uh, the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua said three different times in the book of Revelation, I am the Aleph Tav, or I am the Alpha and the Omega. And he drives that home to us from the very first sentence to the very ending of the book of Revelation. He tells us, I tell you, the end 
from the beginning. What an amazing thing as we looked at that first, first sentence and how it helps us to look at where we're going today and recognize that Yeshua was presented to us and the plan was given to us from the very first book. We looked at Noah and uh, the story of Noah's life, the covenant that God brought to Noah. And it says that this covenant was to Noah and his sons and their descendants. And that's us, folks. He brought this covenant. It is a non-conditional uh, covenant, uh, one that God made with us. We looked at the verses and said these are the family records of Noah. And Noah was a righteous man. We discussed that quite a bit yesterday about righteousness and how we get that. And yet the verse says, there is none righteous, no, not one. And we understand that in our own uh, strength, we have no righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy, uh, filthy rags, the scripture tells us. And then we see that we take on his righteousness. So Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries, and Noah walked with God. Boy, I'd like to spend some time on that, and I'd like to understand what it meant that Noah, in such a perverse world that he lived in, corruption everywhere, no one else righteous, no one blameless, and yet he walked with God. There's an example for us. Uh, I believe it's a picture of the Messiah and then a picture of what the Messiah brings to us that we may be able to walk with him. We looked at the generations from Adam to Noah which are ten, from Noah to Abraham which are ten more, and then we looked at those fourteen sets of generations following that as we get down to the Messiah. In Genesis 9, we looked and saw, saw that uh, the scripture says that God said to Noah and his sons with him, and this is to the future generations, understand that I am confirming my covenant with you. This is God's covenant with man. It is an everlasting covenant. And we realize that as we travel our roads today, as we walk the journey and the path that God has set before us, we're reminded of that covenant that God made with Noah and his descendants that's still in effect for us today. Well, I'd like for us to move on and skip down to, to chapter 15 in part of our readings for today and see what God has uh, in store for us and the blessings that he's bringing to us today as we continue this story of creation, of the foundations, of the beginnings of who we are, the heritage that we, uh, that we have as believers in Messiah. We're going to look at Abram. A beautiful story, Abram, the first of the Hebrews, which means to cross over. He believed God and followed him. Let's just look at some of the verses here. Abram believed the Lord. That L-O-R-D is all caps, as you'll see there. And that's the yod heh vav the, the the Yahweh, Yehovah, that we used in, in the Shema at the very beginning of the, the service this morning as we looked at those Hebrew words and we proclaimed his name. Now, Abram, the scripture says, he believed God. Now, that goes right in that category and that list of things that I want to understand more where it said Noah uh, walked with God. Abram believed God and he credited it to him as righteousness. So as we look at these righteous men, we examine how they had a relationship with God and we pattern our lives after that. Now, uh, uh, move to chapter 17. This is about Abram. Uh, it's in his name change and the covenants that God makes with him and how it affects our lives. Abram was 99 years old and you know the story and we've, we've talked about that story of, of him not having a son yet he had the promise of an heir 
and, and uh, all the complications that came in with Hagar and Ishmael and, and all of that. Ishmael's uh, 13 years old now, and Abram is 99 years old. And the Lord, that's that L-O-R-D capital again that we're learning this year, the yod Hey vav Hey. that's the name of God. That's Yahweh, Yehovah. The Lord appeared to him saying... Now, there's been a lot of speculation about what it means that God himself appeared to a person. And I don't know exactly how that works, but the scripture tells us that God himself, the proper name, appeared to him. And he said, I am the Lord Almighty. Now this yod heh vav I inserted that Hebrew there so you'd see that. And it's not the Lord. We took the the out because it is Yahweh. When Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh. And I think it's, it's great that we pronounce his name and realize who he is. Yahweh appeared to him saying, I am the God Almighty. Or I am God Almighty. Almighty. Now that translated in the Hebrew is El Shaddai. Now I'm working on learning some names of God and putting them into, into practice in my own vocabulary. And here's another one that I wanted you to see today. It's the El Shaddai, the God Almighty, El Shaddai. When Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to him saying, I am El Shaddai. Live in my presence and be blameless. Now here's that other statement of the righteous man that believed and, he's, and God says to him, live in my presence. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> I want to live in his presence. Now how do we do that? And that's what we're looking for. How do we, how do we live in his presence? So I looked up that word, live, and, uh, and it actually is translated more of walk, journey in, be in the presence of God. Live in his presence or walk in, in his presence. So this verse takes on a really strong implication of what we are to do if we're going to be men of stature like Abram, and his name changed to Abraham, of, of who he is. He heard God. God said, I am the great, mighty, almighty God, the El Shaddai. Now I want you to live. I want you to walk in my presence. Amazing. Then, following that, he says, I will establish my covenant. He didn't say, we're going to make a covenant and you're going to have a part of it. He says, I'm going to establish a covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. When Abraham heard that, what did he do? He fell face down. God spoke to him, and he says, as for me, my covenant is with you, you will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but your name will be Abraham. For I will make you the father of many nations. And we could go into the, the Hebrew explanation of the changing of the names and, and what that means. And Abraham is the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. What a promise. Abraham's face down and God speaking to him. He says, I'm going to bless you. There's going to be great nations come from you. There's even going to be kings come from you. Uh, I thought about that a little bit and I thought, I wonder if Abram, Abraham knew what a king was at that point. Maybe so. God said to him, I will keep my covenant between me and you and your future offspring throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. There's that word again. Doesn't go away. It's an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. So the covenant is that he will be our God 
and the generations after us. He's there to be their God, and He will establish that. Verse 8 says, And to you and your future offspring, I will give the land where you're residing, all the land of Canaan, as an eternal possession, and I will be their God. As you know, the promise, it goes on and it defines the land and gives the boundaries and all that. And until uh, the, up to this date, Israel has never occupied all of that land. It is an everlasting covenant. It has not been fulfilled yet, but it will. One of these days, I think maybe in our lifetime, we're going to see Israel, if you'll just take a map, draw a rough circle in that area, it, in, it includes all the way from Egypt and Turkey and Iraq and Iran and Syria and all of those countries were promised to Abraham as a future inheritance of his generations. What an amazing thought pattern. Now we're going to move to chapter 18. We see the promise that was given to Abraham. We see that Abraham believed him. He trusted him. God says, walk in this now. Live this out. And so we begin to see the, the story develop of who Abraham is and of his character. Now, in chapter 18, time had passed. Then the Lord, that's that L-O-R-D capitals again, that's the yod heh vav -He, Yahweh. Yahweh, singular, appeared to Abram, Abraham, changed his name, at the Oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting in the entrance of his tent during the heat of the day. Abraham was a shepherd. He uh, owned lots of, of uh, livestock. They moved frequently. The land was not great uh, productive land, and so they moved their herds around. And he was in his tent. It was in the heat of the day. And Yahweh appeared to him. You got that vision in your mind for a moment? Abram looked up, and he saw three men standing near him. Wait, I, I thought it was Yahweh. He saw three men standing near him. God himself. Very interesting. Well, you can spend some time researching and thinking about that and trying to figure out how God presented himself to Abraham in the form of three men. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet them, and he bowed to the ground. Uh, if you look at that, it's he threw himself on the ground. He, he buried his face in front. He knew who was there. This wasn't his first experience, remember. And he looked up, and there they were, Yahweh, before him. I'm sure that's not a very good depiction, but there is Abraham face down on the ground seeing Yahweh himself. Then he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not go past your servant. Don't bypass me. Don't go on. Stay here. Let a little water be brought that you may wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Now, we know the story. We don't have time to read all the verses there, but Abraham begins a dialogue with God himself. Represented in three men that are there. Abraham goes and prepares food, kills a calf, has Sarah uh, prepare food. They have a great feast. So some time happens if you look at it logistically and realize that they went and slaughtered a, a calf and cooked it and, and, and had a, a feast. He washed their feet. Wouldn't it be interesting to know what all they talked about? Now we have some little snippets of the story that's there. I'm sure not the whole story. 
but all that God needs for us that we need to know for God's purpose in our lives of knowing who he is. That's the time when the announcement was made from God himself to Abraham that Sarah, this time next year, would have a child. She wasn't pregnant at the time. Uh, she was beyond childbearing uh, age. Abram, Abraham was 99, going on 100. And they were getting ready to have their first child. Get that in your mind. If you can. Sarah laughed. <laughs> chuckled. But it was just inward. And God began to work in their lives. Not began, that's the wrong statement, isn't it? He continued to be present in their lives. Now, skip over to chapter 22 as we bring this story together. Isaac was born in this interim period that we're skipping over. Uh, a year later, about that time, uh, there's, there's a bunch of speculation about dates and when this happened and how God orchestrated it. And it just, it's just amazing to even contemplate uh, about all the symbolism and all of how that works together. That's another story, maybe for another time. Isaac is born... The conflict between Ishmael and Isaac, or at least between Hagar and Sarah, escalates. We have all kinds of, of little intertwined stories about what's happening there. Time has passed. Abraham is confident in what God is providing for him. He's provided the miracle son. The one that they could not have. Only by the power of God could it have happened. And after these things, God tested Abraham. That's a pretty tough sentence, isn't it? We've looked at that, talked about it recently, of trials and testing. and God, the scripture says tested Abraham. Did God need to test Abraham? I thought God knew everything. He does. But Abraham needed to be tested. You see the difference? God knew the outcome. But Abraham needed to be tested. Sometimes I wonder if... Uh, you and I need to be tested. Even though we don't want to. At all. But our testing, many times, teaches us and brings us strength. Helps us to become an overcomer. The scripture says here that God tested Abraham. I'm convinced that God didn't need to know what he would do. But I am convinced that Abraham needed to know what he would do. So God tested him. Abraham said, here I am. God says to him, Abraham, take your son, your only son, there's a couple of stories right there, rabbit trails we could go on, aren't there? Because Ishmael was his son. But this was the son of the promise. Your only son, whom you love. Now, only a parent can understand about the love of their children. God understood and he recognized that Abraham 
had this bond with this promised child that he had waited a hundred years for, that he taught and walked with, that he was so excited about the future of this young man because this man was going to produce generations, multiples of people, and even kings. And Abraham believed God. Remember? He trusted God. God says, take this son, your only son, go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering. Uh, if you're a stranger to God's Word and you begin to read that, you'd think, what kind of God is this? He tells a man to go and murder his son and offer him as a burnt offering? Let's read the story and see what happens. He says, I'll tell you where to go. The next verse is just right there. So, Abraham got up and did it. I, humanly speaking, I think there was a whole lot between those verses. How could he have even slept? How could he just get up and take his only son, the promised one, and take him and take his life? He got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took with him two of his young men and his son, Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering, set out to go to a place God had told him about. Abraham and his son, some wood on a donkey, two servants going with them. Can you just imagine what that trip was like? It brings tears to your eyes to think about a father who loved his son that much, and yet he loved God more. And he said, I trust you, God. And he led him on the journey, and God showed him Mount Moriah, I believe, is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. When Abraham recognized what was going on and where they were, he told the servants to stay there. And he told his son, Isaac, take the wood, put it on your back, and we'll go to the mount. And he told his servants, we will return. Now that's faith. Because he knew what was going to happen. The scripture says he took the fire. Some would think it was in a pot. Coals, burning fire. Could have been on a torch. Some of the pictures you'd see depicted would be a live fire. He took the fire, and he took the sacrificial knife. This was a special knife, probably an heirloom. One that Isaac probably had never been able to hold yet, because it was a special utensil used in offering sacrifices. He knew what it was. We don't have a lot of dialogue and understanding of what Abraham might have told Isaac on the journey. But from this point where they left the two uh, servants and they began their trek up the mountain of Mount Moriah, Isaac says, Dad, you've got the fire, you've got the knife, I've got the wood, where's the lamb? Great question. Abraham said, 
God will provide. He believed God. He trusted God. He went on. When he got there, there was no lamb or ram or animal suitable for sacrifice. The scripture says that he bound his son as you would an animal to offer for sacrifice. And he took the knife and he was going to cut his throat. And he actually started. And God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, this has gone through my mind lots of times through the years. What was it that Abraham was thinking? Was it that he was thinking that if God told me to do this, and I do it, God will resurrect him, and we'll go back together? Could be. Don't know his thoughts, but we do know his actions. He was obedient to God. God told him to do something, and he did it. Remember back, he said, God said, Abraham, before he ever changed his name, walk in my presence. I don't think this was the first day that he had walked in his presence. I think God knew his heart. I'm not sure that Abraham knew his heart. But now he was tested. And he passed the test. He, with all intention, was going to sacrifice his son. It's a beautiful story. There's a lot of implications there. And some would even say that from this point forward that this son was given back to him because Abraham had considered him dead. That he actually was raised from the dead. At least in Abraham's side. Abraham raised the knife And he started the process that he had done many, many times in offering a sacrifice to God. And God said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know that you would do what I've told you to do. Now, I believe God knew that before. But this is for Abraham's strength. For him to know that God trusts him. For him to know that I will do what's right. For him to be able to stand and to witness to other people and to share with other people how majestic this God really is. This God took my son's life and gave it back to me. How thankful do you think Abraham was for that ram that was caught in the thicket? What kind of a sacrifice do you think that was when Abraham loosed his son and together they offered a sacrifice? tears at your heart to think about the grace and the mercy of God. Abraham was asked to offer as a sacrifice his only son. It was the beginning of a heritage that would actually cause the same thing to happen. Abraham didn't 
sacrifice his son. He was willing to sacrifice his son, and he was obedient to God. But God himself did exactly what he asked Abraham to do. He sacrificed his only begotten son. Abraham was really grateful for the sacrifice of that ram. Isaac was very grateful for the sacrifice of that ram because it meant life. It meant a change of history. It meant that Isaac would go on. It meant that Israel would be born. It meant that King David would come. It meant that the Messiah would come. And then the story happens over. The man who sacrifices his son. Why? So that life may happen. So that you might have life. So that I might have life. You see, the story happened for Abraham and Isaac so that Isaac might have life. But if Isaac hadn't have had life, we would not have had life. It's the same story. God just repeats it over and over and over again until the Messiah becomes the ultimate sacrifice. And you and I can have life. Jesus said in John 10, I've come that you might have life. We're talking about a sacrifice on an altar where a man's son had to die so that I might experience life. Now I believe that God says to you and to me the same thing he said to Abraham. Live in my presence. Be aware that you're living in my presence. Walk in my presence. Be aware that you now are the righteousness of God. Not by what you've done, but by what I have given you. What did he give us? The Messiah said life and life abundantly. Now that verse, John chapter 10, comes with a warning before that. And he says the adversary, Satan, the devil himself, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Let me tell you, you don't have to look very far to see what's happening. In our lives, in this world, in, in our society, the adversary is there to steal. What's he stealing? Your identity. He's stealing the faith that you have. He's stealing the principles that we live for and that our forefathers have died for. He's stealing who we are, our integrity. And he wants to kill. He wants to kill your witness. He wants to, to kill all that you are. And not only physically and spiritually, he wants to destroy you. Eternally. It is a battle, a war that's raging. That's the reason God said to Abraham, Abraham, walk in my presence. Live in my presence. You don't know what's coming down the road. You need to walk in my presence today because a couple of chapters later I'm going to ask you to do a very difficult thing. Walk in my presence. Live in my presence. I believe that's the same story this told over and over and over in God's Word. I am so grateful for the story of Abraham. 
And I'm so grateful for that ram that was caught in the thickets. That he provided a way out for Abraham. Because Abraham was faithful. He didn't have to watch his son die. And even if God had resurrected him from the dead, I don't believe Abraham could have ever gotten over that nightmare of taking his son's life. I'm grateful for that ram that was caught in the thicket. But that really doesn't compare with the sacrifice of our Messiah on the cross. Folks, we need to live a grateful life, thankful that God Himself would die on that cross so that you and I might have life. Walk in it. Trust it. Believe it. As these, our forefathers, have taught us before us. What a challenge in my life. What a challenge for you. The grateful heart that cries out to the Savior and says thank you for the sacrifice at Calvary. Thank you that you died that I might have life and have it abundantly, the joy that comes in walking. Can you imagine being the two servants, the young men, that were at the foot of Moriah, not knowing anything that went on on the mountain, and them coming back arm in arm and them asking how was the sacrifice? Did God show up? He always does. When we sacrifice He's always there. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you today with grateful hearts proclaiming your name, Yahweh, Yehovah, the great I Am, the El Shaddai, the bright morning star, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the soon coming and reigning Messiah. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you came that we might have life and that we could have it abundantly. And we thank you for your warning of the adversary. Help us to be strong, to walk in your presence, to recognize when you speak to us, to be obedient in everything that you teach us, that we may become the people you've called us to be. Help us to realize that we are the righteousness of God, that it is all because of you and your sacrifice that we may stand before you in robes that are washed white. Father, we thank you and glorify your name. We praise you with all of our hearts. We've gathered together and we have bowed before you and worshiped you. Now God, help us to walk in your presence. Help us to understand what it is to trust you. Help us to understand that you have pronounced us as righteous. Now give us wisdom. Give us strength. 
Give us courage as we leave this place because we live in a wicked and perverse world. Help us to be strong and to trust you. We praise your name. We glorify it on high. For it's in the name of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah, that we pray and proclaim these things and say, Amen and Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.